darkness. Then in the darkness, a light. Maybe a cord. We see a small tobacco plant. It's pretty modest. Maybe we watch it grow. From the darkness steps the ensemble, who were once protesters, who are still protesters, but now also the cultivators of this space, the makers of the world. We're walking through, they bring our fields to life as light rises from the plant and shines down on the Connecticut River Valley. Welcome to the Connecticut River Valley. Isn't she lovely? Oh, you're from here. All right then, don't let me slow you down. But listen, you look like you just got comfortable. Maybe you think you know the valley. Winding country back roads, cute colonial houses, lush greenery as far as the eye can see and rivers slicing through the other side of that. See them setting up for the summer? Over there, those field hands are putting up shade tents. What are shade tents? For shade tobacco. The plants can't take too much direct sunlight. It's a big business around these parts. I thought you said you were from here. Tobacco was first used by Native Americans who cultivated the plant and smoked it in pipes for medicinal and ceremonial purposes. Christopher Columbus took a few leaves and seeds with him back to Europe, but most Europeans didn't get their first taste of tobacco until the mid-16th century, when diplomats and adventurers like Francis Jean Nicot, for whom nicotine is named, began to popularize its use. Tobacco was introduced to France in 1556, and Portugal in 1558, Spain in 1559, and England in 1565. The first successful commercial crop was grown in Virginia in 1612 by Englishman John Rolfe. Within seven years, it was the colony's largest export. And over the next 200 years, the growth and demand for tobacco as a cash crop fueled the need for slave labor. Troublesome plants. Around here we grow broadleaf, we're wrapping the tobacco. And well, the centuries turn. In 1920, you get prohibition. Guess what shoots up in popularity? Which brings us to the summer of 1944. A young Martin Luther King Jr. is boarding a train from Georgia to Connecticut. Simsbury, Connecticut of all places. Why? One reason, my friends. The tobacco leaf.
Traveling to a summer job on the Cullman Brothers Tobacco Farm in the summer of 1944 in Simsbury, a 15-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. marveled at the sight of communities moving beyond segregation. Two little pigs were driving around, looking for something to do. Two little pigs drove across town, looking for something to shoot. They received a call about a big bad wolf, walking alone in the park. He was brown, so they shot him down, quicker than he could bark. The wolf, it seems, just a kid with dreams who went by the name Tamir. A 12-year-old boy playing with a toy who thought he had nothing to fear. The pigs in blue saw nothing new but a black man committing a crime. And a bullet, no two, took a life so new, robbing the child of time. His blood, their skin, and the color of their suits. These are what make up the red, white, and blue. So what are you writing? A letter home to my father. I've just started. What's it say? Well, I've just started. But so far I've got. On our way here, we saw some things I've never anticipated to see. After we passed Washington, there was no discrimination at all. The white people here are very nice. We go any place we want to and sit anywhere we want to. Hmm. All right. Well, what do you think? Of what? All of it. Connecticut. I've never seen any place so... Green? Green. Yeah. But not quite like home. Folks may be a little bit less cantankerous, but nothing's ever quite the same as home. Not quite. Yeah. What do you think it'll be like when we get to Simsbury? Hot. Humid. Lots of hard work. Maybe if you're lucky too, a little bit of dancing. Lots of sun. The sunlight of opportunity. The other America. Not quite for what they're paying us. Not quite, but it's something. Something indeed. My friend, here we are. Well, my friend, here we are. Breathe in that good northern air. 
Good old Simsbury. Who knew? Hey, watch it. You bumped into me. I'll help. Listen. It's fine, Weasel. I'm just... I'm just happy to be here. Traveling to a summer job on the Cullman Brothers Tobacco Farm in Simsbury in the summer of 1944, a 15-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. marveled at the sight of communities moving beyond segregation. On our way here, we saw some things I've never anticipated to see. Writing a letter home is hard. For my father, I have to get it right. After he passed Washington, there was no discrimination at all. The white people here are very nice. We go any place we want to and sit anywhere we want to. Keep working on it, kid. You'll get it right eventually. Forsyth County, Georgia. Accused, Robert Edwards, Ernest Knox, arrested. No witnesses, no evidence. May Crow, 18, found barely alive. Raped, beaten, left for dead by Brown's Bridge. Two black men accused of raping a white daughter. 2,000 locals wait at coming jail, chanting, angry, bitter, vengeful, searching for violence. Knox knew how to play the system, he admitted to the crime and was left protected by the jail cells that would become his new home. Edwards refused to admit to a crime he'd never commit. 2000 versus one. Badly beaten, barely breathing, body bloodied and bruised. That wasn't enough. Shot and shot, each shot repeated. Still not enough. Dragged out, hung up on a telephone pole. His body so mutilated it became hardly recognizable. Forsyth County. Night riders waged war. As cowards, they hid in the dark. Sharecroppers and Christians by day, killers and terrorists by night. They set fire to Back Band Church. They bombed houses. They forced out 1,100 African Americans. They stole Thomas Roper's land, the horses, pigs, and cows. Their livelihood, their freedom, their children, their friends, their parents. Attacked the white families who aimed to stop this horror took headstones from black cemeteries and made them flags. 1865 through 1950, 6,400 lynchings in Forsyth County, chased and kept out African Americans. For 75 years, none returned to the war zone. Segregation wasn't needed. There were no African Americans to eat at restaurants, to learn a New Hope Elementary School, a new hope that would be left on pause, to worship in church, they chased out their teachers and their preacher, Grant Smith. This unforgivable past still haunting, keeping many African Americans hiding away. Kane is one of the young black men from the South who worked picking tobacco during wartime while regular farm workers were fighting in World War II. Despite his young age, he was admitted to a special program at Morris College in Atlanta designed to keep the college afloat during the war. In a June 18, 1944 letter to his mother, King wrote that he and his friends had not worked the previous day and ended up dining at one of Hartford's restaurants. He wrote that he was shocked as he had never thought that a person of my race could eat anywhere. We started to pull this all this together and what it seemed his letters kept coming back to, the most significant part, was what it was like to be outside the South for the very first time. He talked about things like going to church with white people for the very first time, which is something he never done. 
The Morehouse youths attended church in Hartford and Simsbury, with the local one being the first desegregated church many had seen. Negroes and whites go to the same church. King wrote in a June 11, 1944 letter to his mother. Emmett L. Proctor Jr., a boyhood friend of King's, told the Journal Inquirer in 1989 that Alberta, King's mother, was very reluctant to let him go to Connecticut at such a young age and a long look at the program before consenting. His free time at the Coleman Brothers was often doing religious work. And Keane wrote in some of his letters to his family that he was selected as the worker's religious leader and had taken charge at Sunday services where he can speak on any biblical text he wants. King even traced his desire to become a minister to that summer in Simsbury, as he noted in his application to Atlantis Crozier Theological Seminary in June 1948. When asked to provide his reason for wanting to study for the gospel ministry, King said his call was quite different than most explanations he'd heard. This decision came about in the summer of 1944 when I felt an inescapable urge to serve society. King wrote, In short, I felt a sense of responsibility which I could not escape. After working the next two summers elsewhere, King returned to Coleman Brothers in 1947. Proctor was Keynes' picking partner in 1944 and said in 1989 the pair once emerged last from a row of tobacco and were approached by a foreman who suggested that they take the job of raising and lowering the nets. The two ended up falling asleep and were left at the field while everyone else finished their work for the day. On their way back to the boarding house, Proctor said they found themselves surrounded in the dark by hulking animals and cried out in fear, only to discover the next morning that the creatures were only cattle. In a June 11, 1944 letter to his mother, King wrote that, Our work is very easy. We have to get up at 6 every day and be in bed at 10. He said that he had a job in the kitchen, which allowed him to get better food. And more, I get as much as I want. Pickens described Keane, who regularly sent money home to his family as He also said that young Keane was a practical joker, and one of his popular pranks was in which he lit a match between the toes of a sleeping person, though this usually wasn't harmful. Desegregated Connecticut. Desegregated Desegregated. Desegregated Connecticut. Changed. Changed. Changed King. Desegregated Connecticut. Changed King. Though King spoke little publicly about his two summers in Connecticut, those close to him talked of how the experience of living in a desegregated society had racially, spiritually, and physically changed him. Though it was hardly a glamorous job, my husband would later talk of the exhilarating sense of freedom he felt to be able to eat in any restaurant and to sit in the orchestra at the movies in Connecticut. King's wife, Coretta Scott King, wrote in her biography, When the train on which he was coming home reached the southern states and he went to have a meal in the dining car, the waiter ushered him to a rear seat and pulled the curtain down in front of him. I felt as though that curtain had dropped on my selfhood, Martin said. Curtis said that life outside of a world of segregation seemed to be a really big effect on King. I think there was just that realization. That maybe there is another way. And that there is this whole other part of America where segregation doesn't exist. That may have been an influence as to what he went on to do. I'd, I'd like, like to, to think, think it was. was. So what do you think? It's just... Still can't get it right, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well... I wonder... If the reason you can't get your letter right... Is because... As good as all those things are, us getting to go places we don't usually get to go, and put our bodies in spaces we've been told they shouldn't be... Maybe you think bodies should just get to be places. Like, maybe one body isn't worth any more or any less than any other body. 
Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Man, kid, we're gonna have to teach you how to relax. Looks like it's almost time for bed anyways. Come on, Weasel, maybe we should head inside. You go on ahead. I'm gonna stay out here and stargaze a little while longer. Death fills the air in my aunt Subaru, taps on the window glass, and is ready to escape into the world after we drive past the black man on the street and she spews, no wonder they can't run from the police, his pants are at his feet, and she smirks and scoffs as I freeze and I swear for a second I could see his body laying lifelessly. Lifelessly like 12 year old Tamir Rice, who couldn't run for his life, not because his pants were sagging but because you can't really outrun a bullet. The speed of light fired at him twice within the two seconds police had him in sight. He died unaware as to why, unaware that police see black boys as violent beings before they even reach their teens, unaware as to why even the park is not a safe place for him to run free. Lifelessly, like 26-year-old Brianna Taylor who couldn't run, not because she was sagging her pants but because she was already home with no safer place to go when cops and their ammo broke down her front door and shot her dead by her own bed. Her life fleeting earth as 32 bullets tore through her apartment walls, tore through her bed sheets, tore through her dresser, tore through her home as six bullets tore through her being before she could even speak. Lifelessly, like 46-year-old George Floyd who couldn't run, not because he was sagging his pants, but because of the police knee nudged in the crevice of his neck, because of the air that was quickly fleeing from his lungs as he used his last breath to plead for his life, and his words only echoed past white ears, echoed off into history, echoed off into that place of silenced voices, unheard screams, unheard by too many, unheard pleas that end up lost and re-screamed another day by another black person. Lifelessly like Eric Gardner, lifelessly like Michael Brown, lifelessly like Walter Scott, lifelessly like Alton Sterling, like Philando Castile, like Stefan Clark, like Jamari Tarver, like Tyree Davis, like Tina Marie Davis, like Brandon Deontay Roberts, like Queen Jones, like Michael Lee, like Elijah McLean, like Ahmaud Aubrey, like Jeanette Wilson, like the countless others who can't run from police brutality, who can't run from systematic racism, who can't run from the bloody racist history of this nation, who can't run from white people like white people run from it all, who can't run from the racism white people run people of color into the ground with, into their graves with, and my aunt and her Subaru, who is also a New Jersey judge, must know this and act like she just doesn't. I could only feel her death wish, thick and hot in the air of her car, knowing racism never stays confined to the racist. It emits from her skin like rancid must, doesn't wash off in the shower, follows her to work in the courthouse, and fills the air she surrounds with this deadly pollution. Think cigarettes come from where? Where do you think they come from? Gas station? That guy at the back of the bar? That ditch you woke up in last Sunday when you should have been getting dressed for church? Or well, they come from somewhere? Cigarettes more than some gentle smoking, sinning. It's got a bit of a wild history. Got a bit of a dark past. I knew this guy. I knew this dude. It's this one thing I love, he said. Only in darkness can you see the stars. Yeah. Come on, Weasel. Tobacco fields in the daytime are uh, this whole other vibe. It's wild with people. Business. Day starts early in tobacco field. But the nights, the nights are quiet. Because when everyone's gone and the fields are quiet, when everyone stops interrupting the earth and everything she has to say, when people and all their words have gone home for dinner, crickets. 
God, the earth. She loses it. Weasel, you coming or what? Weasel, you coming or what? Wait a minute. Come on back. I see something. Someone. Psst. Who are you? What are you doing? Nobody. We're not going anywhere. Are those your shoes? Yeah, we're just holding them so they don't get dirty. Nice lie. I don't buy it. Come on, we should go. We're going dancing. Dancing? That sounds nice. Where? This ice cream place. Well, listen. We don't mean to cause you any trouble, but we just got here from Georgia and we'd love it if you wanted to show us around for a little. You want to come dancing? Don't go inviting just anyone. They're not just anyone. They're cute. Oh, boy. So you come with us? What do you say, Tweet? I guess that might be nice. All right. Then let's party. Feel it blue, feel it hot, 
beat a little faster. Diggy, 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 diggy,
Whoa, Tweed, are you seeing this? I can almost reach it. I'm taller, why can't I see too? What's written on these? More of your letters home? Those are private, mostly. How does a man become great? How does someone consider themselves in the world? Don't they know their own words? Why, Why do we, we let, let business, business speak but silence people? When I bring my first love to the house, a black man with brown eyes and braids and a smile that sets my heart on fire. Under the porch light, I wait, breathless, to share the star of my life. The owner of the woodsy cologne you smell on me every time I stumble home at night after hours of being held by the world's most gentle man. I only notice, in hindsight, the tight shoulders of his, who I make fun of daily because of his slouch. The warm, humor-filled sheen in his eyes, absent when we walk toward the house as if he knew he was unwelcome. Before he crosses the threshold, an American flag looming above as we wait for the door to unlock, but it sounds like a bullet going off when it turns. The door opens, but your arms remain at your sides. You, my mother, smile like a sniper is aimed at your chest. Was the gunshot not my imagination, but heard somehow between the woman who gave me life and the man who makes me feel alive? Dear Mother, I received your letter and was very glad to hear from you. I am doing fine and still having a nice time. Tell everybody at home hello. We went to church Sunday in Simsbury and we were the only Negroes there. Negroes and whites go to the same church. Sunday morning, we had church in the board house and I led it. I am the religious leader. I have to speak on some text every Sunday to 107 boys we really have good meetings. Our work is very easy. We have to get up at 6 o'clock every day and be in bed at 10 o'clock. I have a job in the kitchen, so I get better food than any of the boys, and more. I get as much as I want. Tell Daddy hello, and I'm praying for the church and all. I will write again soon. Your son. June 18, 1944. Dear Mother Dear, I received your letter today and was very glad to hear from you. Yesterday we didn't work so we went to Hartford. We really had a nice time there. I never thought that a person of my race could eat anywhere, but we ate in one of the finest restaurants in Hartford. On our way here, we stopped in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is a pretty large place. And we also many large ships, some as large as the Bethel Church and larger. We also saw many airplanes. We went under the Hudson River and entered New York. It is the largest place I have ever seen in my life. 
We might go there the 4th of July or either Boston Mass. They are both near here. The sun has begun to get pretty hot. But that is not the beginning, they say. It is going to be so hot here in July that you can hardly take it. But I am going to take it somehow. Mother, I can't send but $10 home this week because they took out the railroad fare and board. It will be the same for the next two weeks. We went to a church Sunday in Simsbury and we were the only Negroes there. Negroes and whites go to the same church. Sunday morning, we had church in the board house and I led it. I am the religious leader. I have to speak on some text every Sunday to 107 boys who really have good names. I have a job in the kitchen, so I get better food than any of the boys, and more I get as much as I want. Tell daddy hello, and I'm praying for the church and all. I will write again soon. Your son. Ten-year-old me, resilient, ruthless, and racist inside the Tahoe Chevy. Brookfield bound, lock on my door, seat belt fastened, dad's hand out the window. A bluebird day is upon us, my eyes traveling across. Rustic brick and mortar buildings, apartments overhead. Boys and girls with dark hooded sweatshirts styled with Air Jordan True Flight. Rainbow graffiti abused the walls, sidewalk scratched and cracked, big league chew flattened to confetti. 21-year-old me, aware, authentic, and anti-racist, watching ABC News. Gated up windows, vacant apartments, boys and girls with Black Lives Matter signs, styled with masks, sunburn scaled arms, and burnt faces. George Floyd, murdered on asphalt. 8 minutes and 46 seconds. Viral videos. Murals light up the walls. Sidewalks graffitied but glorified. Trinity Street. Yellow school bus. Hand-painted mosaic on asphalt. 860. Stand with black women. Black girl magic. Life and liberty of happiness. The rose that grew from concrete. Equality, unite together, excellent. Time changes, I will breathe. I stand with you, black, white, and people of color. I march with you, black, white, and people of color. I preach with you, black, white, and people of color. I am here with you, black, white, and people of color. I listen with you, black, white, and people of color. Sixteen special letters. MLK and Emmett board a train to head home to Georgia. Done with tobacco for the summer done. All around the train, in every street, in every town, as they have been throughout, the protesters gather beneath windows. People smoking above. Someone stubs out their cigarette and flicks it below. One of the protesters is hit, angry. Hey, up there in the window, you gonna join us down here in the street?
They have to head to the back of the train. He's so angry. He's so, 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 so angry. I just don't get it. You and I both know. We know how hard people work for other people's gangs. We've done it. How can we all agree to live like this? MLK is angry. He pulls the curtain open. Right as someone else, someone protesting, throws a Molotov cocktail. A building catches on fire and the crowd step back to take it in. There's a silence and it stretches out as a fire burns and the train steams ahead. Hey Mike, can I ask you a question? Sure Weasel. How do people consider themselves in the world? Don't they know their own worth? And aren't we tired of it? I think I finally figured out this letter. The one for your dad? I thought it was for my dad, but actually, it's for all of us. I want to get off here. Can we, can we get off the train now, please? It's not safe here right now, friend. Uh, why don't you take a seat? You look tired. It's just, I feel a little, I feel a little off. Like there's a shadow out there, and I'm waiting for it to catch up to me. Well, I'm tired of waiting. The train screeches to a sudden halt. The fire has burned itself out. The protesters watch MLK as he exits the train to stand on the steps and the steps become a pulpit, and the protesters become an audience. They've been waiting so long to be an audience. Emmett joins them. MLK is nervous because a minute ago, he was 15, and it was the end of the summer. And suddenly, he's an adult and everyone is staring at him. Where are the words again? Emma has his letter and... Don't be scared. Be loud. There are two Americas. In this America, one is beautiful for situation. In this America, millions of people have the milk of prosperity and the honey of equality flowing before them. This America is the habitat of millions of people who have food and material necessities for their bodies, culture, 
and education for their minds, freedom and human dignity for their spirits. In this America, children grow up in the sunlight of opportunity, but there is another America.